claim to be the unique, only begotten, incarnate Son of God. And then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. On the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. He sees you and you alone. And on that cross, Jesus had the capacity to think of you. And he loved you enough to stay on the cross. Was there ever such love as that? And when they went out to the tomb that morning, they heard the greatest news the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. And if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have any gospel. Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive. Today's passage is from the New Testament, book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 3 through 16. In our narrative today, life is taking place. There is plotting, there is fear, there is power, there is love, and there is celebration. As I read, you may notice that Matthew places a great expression of honor between two bookends of deception. Matthew 26, 3 to 16 says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Why would Matthew drop this act of love in two, the middle of two acts of deceit? Maybe, just maybe, he is pointing us to this question. What is Jesus worth to us? How do we personally value Jesus? In our narrative, Lisa talked about the two bookends. In the first book and at the beginning of that narrative that she read as penned by Matthew, it talks about the chief priest and the elders. These were members of the Sanhedrin, key Israelite leaders of the time. And then it goes on and Matthew adds for the first time in his gospel about Caiaphas. Caiaphas being 
the highest human authority of Israel at the time. And it says that they plotted, plotted to arrest Jesus. And it's interesting how Matthew puts his emphasis on this. He says in some sly way, some stealth way, some secretive way they were wanting to do this. What were they wanting to do? Is not just arrest him, but kill him. And it says, but not during the feast. So at this time, the feast would have been the Passover that was up and coming. And Jerusalem would have swelled five times its normal uh, population during this time. And they were concerned about Jesus' popularity of those times and the riot or the things that could happen because of arresting a figure like Jesus of this time. So the question comes, as Lisa brought it out so well, what is Jesus worth to these religious leaders? He's worth more dead than alive. Why? Fear of his popularity, fear of his authority, pride, power, control, all these things. And then the second bookend that Lisa indicated at the very end, we have one of the 12 disciples, Judas Iscariot, that would have walked with Jesus, heard of his teachings. And it says that he went to the chief priest and he begins to plan this plot of deception about turning Jesus over at the time. And he asks, what will you get for this? And they tell him 30 silver coins or 30 pieces of silver. So to Judas, Jesus is worth 30 pieces of silver. Why? Maybe Jesus didn't add up to what Judas wanted him to add up to. Maybe Judas saw himself as somehow having authority, him having power. Uh, saw Jesus as a ruler, earthly ruler in those ways. But Jesus was so much more. He was the servant leader. He was the example. He was the savior come to rescue mankind from our sins. But Judas missed the picture. And for him, the value of Jesus was cheapened in his eyes and his life to 30 pieces of silver. But then sandwiched in between those two bookends is the story of love and dedication, as Lisa indicated. It says, well, Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper. So Bethany is two miles east of Jerusalem at the time. It's on the ridge of the Mount of Olives. And it says that he's in Simon the leper's house. So this was most likely one of the hundreds of people that Jesus would have healed in his earthly ministry at some point in time. It says a woman comes in with an alabaster jar. And I love how Matthew pens this. He says, very, he emphasizes very expensive perfume. And it says that he's, as he's reclining, which would have been the normal posture, she comes up and pours this perfume over Jesus' head. This was an expression of her love to Jesus, a token of respect and honor for Jesus. It was all about Jesus for her. He wasn't just the main focus, Jesus was her focus. She understood the season, the moment that she was in and captured that with her heart and honored Jesus. And then we have the disciples. They asked the question, why? Why, why does this happen? Why are you doing this? This could have been sold and the money given to the poor. And it wasn't that they were wrong because Jesus did teach that, that we are to take care of those in need but they missed the timing, they missed the season, the moment they were in. The woman realized that. And so Jesus answers a question with a question, and I love how he does that. And he says, why are you so bothered with this act? Why? And then he starts laying it out there. The poor you have with you always, you're gonna have those opportunities, but I'm here for a short time. She realizes this. And she sees what's to come and is preparing me for my burial. She's honoring the moment. She's honoring the season. And it says, wherever the gospel is preached, this story will be told. The gospel of Matthew has it pinned down for all of us to read and to celebrate this act of love and devotion. It's part of the 66 canonical books of the Bible 
worded in there for all to read, see, and enjoy. And so really the question comes down to, as Lisa said, I guess personally, what is Jesus worth to me? And when I think about Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I think about my sins, my failures, my wrongdoings, where I've missed the mark at times. And I think about the need to have that paid for. Jesus came to this earth to, although no sin in his life, the perfect lamb, the perfect example of what it is to be a godly example. And he went to the cross for us, for me. He took my sins of debt that I could not pay and he nailed them to the cross. This Easter season, we're honoring, we're talking about, we're remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so for me, personally, the worth of Jesus is everything. He gave me life. He gave me eternal life, a blessed hope to live in each and every day. He gave me the opportunity to have my sins reconciled and to live for him forever. And I, there's a lot of value in that. And really the question remains, as we read this text and we look at this narrative that Matthew has penned so well, and this story of devotion sandwiched in the middle, it's time to ask yourself, what is Jesus worth to you? What value does Jesus have in your personal life? And if there's value of Jesus in your life and he's worth everything, how are you living? How are we living our life for Jesus, our Savior? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made, and him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not recognize it. The light shines through the darkness, but the darkness didn't even notice. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Even in his own land and among his own people, he wasn't wanted, but to those who believed him to those who believed in his name, to those who believed he was how he claimed and would do what he said. He gave the right to become children of God. And we have seen his glory, the glory that a one and only son can only receive from his father, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became human and lived here on earth among us. And having become human, he stayed human. He humbled himself. He didn't accept any special privileges. He lived a selfless, obedient life to die a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that crucifixion. But it was our sins that did that to him. He was bruised and wounded for everything that we've done wrong. He was wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. He did all this just so we could be whole. And God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confessed that Jesus is the master of all. This is the resurrection, that the Son came and gave his life, that he extended an invitation to know the God of all creation, that he offered us love when we knew no peace, that he offered us relationship when all we knew how to do was keep and break a bunch of rules. This is the resurrection, that in his death we have come to know life, that we can freely offer our life to him.